Now, this is a very interesting topic because it affects each and every one of you here, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. The world economy, where are we going in the last days? Colonel Anthony Schaffer is a retired, he just retired, intelligence officer. And he said, in the light of what happened in Paris, he said this. He said, the whole world is a battlefield. And you know, he is spot on. He is absolutely right. You can be sitting here one moment in peace, and the next moment it could be panic. And it is not going to get better. And so, when you look at this, I like some of the statements that I saw. I'd like to feel what, see and read what people say. And some of the statements made an impact on me. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. I like that. That's a maturity. I like that. Judgment is important. We condemn what was done. It is despicable. It, is, it has no words. But we always must bear in mind, but more important is by which standard this judgment is made. And you have to be very qualified with your judgment. That's very important. But wasn't it a terrible thing? What an aftermath. I watched on CNN this young lady in the left-hand top corner. She was interviewed. She was one of those people in that restaurant where so many killings found place. And I was profoundly impressed because she said she felt she was going to die. She, to her, this was going to be her last moment. And she turned to the next person to her who was mortally wounded. And as they were dying, she was saying, she did that to a few people, she was saying to them, I love you. She said, I, don't, I didn't know them. I, 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 I just had to say that. I had to tell them that I loved them because I didn't want to die without love in my heart. Amazing statement. I respected that. It's, it's very impressive. Okay, talking about these things and world economy. Fighting the war on terror has cost Australian taxpayers more than 20 billion since September 2001, 9-11. That is a lot of money. The hospitals, the schools, the, the education institutions, the support for those who need it could have been funded by the 20 billion dollars. And, and, and it includes 74 million system, uh, for a system enabling police and ASIO to tap phone calls. And you know what? These prices are rising. It is only going to become dearer. Have a look at this. A very prestigious magazine, the Forbes Business. According to data compiled, and they're not relying on their own resources, by the Mercatus Center citing the Congressional Research Service. This is very accurate stuff. The cost of global war on tenor operations, including Afghanistan and Iraq, since 2001, has reached $1.6 trillion by the ending financial year 2014. Six, 1.6 trillion. That is, that is an enormous amount. 1,600 billion. Mind-boggling. What the good that couldn't have done in countries where it is so desperately needed. But they had no choice. And in fact, when you top it up, when Congress approves this one, the one point, it'll, it, the, the, the hundred billion that's still to come for this year, it'll be 1.7 trillion. That's a lot of money. We are, what is this world coming to? It is crazy. Let's talk some uh, more positive things. Let's look at some of the rich people. You may find me amongst them, who knows? Yeah. Not likely. 
This man, Carlos Slim, hello, he's a Mexican, 73 year old. I never knew his name. I was looking up the Forbes list of the most wealthiest people. I've just got a few. He's actually from a Maronite Christian background, but that's all there is. He's a business magnet and he's done rather well, $77.1 billion. And, and just, just to uh, Warren Buffett, more better known, 85 years old. He did lose a bit of money recently, poor guy, but he's still worth $72.7 billion. He's an agnostic. I was trying to find out what their spiritual background is. Uh, let's pick on another one. Let's pick on another one. This guy, and I didn't know him either, Amencio Ortega, 79 years old. He is a fashion magnate, a very famous label. I can't remember it. That's how famous it is, but that means nothing. Uh, 64.5 billion. Never wears a tie, hates to be photographed, makes sure they never do. Almost a sec uh, exclusive, you know, seclusive. Um, here one, we all know him, Bill Gates, 60 years old, he's done well, 79.2 billion. He's an agnostic. He believes there's a God, but it, he was brought up as a congressionalist, uh, uh, congressionalist uh, but he, he has no personal faith in God, no relationship with God. And yet they have done very well. Now, these are not bad people, but they've done very well. So, so what does that tell you? You know, if you were an, uh, a prosperity preacher, you'd have to explain this. How do they do that? Now, of course, there's a few bad ones. I just mentioned the wicked rich. This is Hosni Mubarak, the one from Egypt. He's in all sorts of trouble, 87 years old. Approximately 7 billion siphoned out of his country. Here's another one. There's a whole list of them. I only mentioned two. Muammar Gaddafi, in excess of 30 billion. Of course, he's dead. And so you look at these people, and to me, when is enough enough? How on earth are you going to spend, let's take the poorest one of them, how on earth are you going to spend $30 billion? If you have a billion dollars and you're seated here, you're one of those quiet ones, if you're a billionaire and you need help to spend it, Talk to me. <laughs> I've got a few good ideas. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, let's get away from that. The almighty dollar. It's all about the almighty dollar. And I love it. Can you read what it says? In God we trust. There is this shopkeeper. And he gets sick and tired of people trying to get credit. And so he puts up a note. In God we trust. The rest of you pay cash. <laughs> Fair enough? Fair enough. There is a pie that is shared all across the world. I want you to have a look at this one. I get this information from the internet. I follow economics. I, I, I follow politics uh, a great deal. I, I, I think it's important. And when you look at the darker tints here, per capita worth $100,000, that's US. Can you see where we are? It's nice, isn't it? We're in the lucky corner. There's North America, of course, that's the European, Scandinavia, etc. That's okay. And then, of course, the blue is under 5,000 US per capita value. What a disparity, isn't it? You know, we have a problem on this planet. We have an enormous disparity. That's what we have. I, I want you to have a look at that map, and I'm going to overlay it with another map. Have a look at this. Have a look at this. That is a corruption index. That's a corruption index, and the darker, the more red it is, the more corrupt it is. We look pretty clean, don't we? Pretty clean. I mean, that's fantastic. So Europe and there and there. Seems that the Christian nations, well, Christian nations seem to be the best still to live in. Corruption has a tremendous um, uh, negative effect on wealth of the average person because of the disparity within that country. Now, <coughs> Oxfam is an organization, charity, <coughs> around the world, and its main aim is to curtail the global poverty. 
That's what it's set out to do. It's a wonderful organization. Of course, a report that was issued this year, and they relied on the information of the annual Credit Suisse Global Wealth State Book. It's a very authoritative uh, source. The world's richest 1%, are you getting this? How many people in, the, in, in this world, on this planet? It's 7.31 billion, I think. Round about that. So 1%. 1%. You can work out how much that is. How many that are. The richest 1% will own more than the rest of the world combined next year. Did you get, does that sinking in? I mean, they... Not everybody believes that, but that is where it's heading. You understand? That's what they're predicting. In fact, they caused quite a stir when they put this up last year. They reported last year that the 85 richest billionaires owed more than the poorest 50% of the world's population combined. That's just 85 billionaires. Something is horribly wrong, isn't it? It is horribly wrong. And it, the problem is, the problem is, it is not getting any better. There are no serious mechanisms that are altering this. Let's, let, let's look at a few. The World Economic Forum meets in Davos in Switzerland, and that was done again this year in January. Beautiful snow, lovely hotels, lovely food, I'm sure. Uh, and lots of people there, and the rhetoric is fantastic because what they do is this. The goal of stymieing the economic crisis, in other words, fighting or, 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 or neutralizing the economic crisis. I can understand that. They want to cure that. And easing the wealth gap. That's what they say they're there for. Uh, I'm not sure. A serious attempt at solving financial disparity. That is what they say. But you know you can have a Davos meeting every year for the next hundred years, and I'm telling you, it's not going to change anything. Not so far, it hasn't. So far, it hasn't. Whether it is the World Economic Forum... United Nations or the International Monetary Fund, and I'll come back on that in a minute. The World Bank, I'll come back on that in a minute. Or any other institution, their poverty relief programs exist to create further dependency. That is, further dependency of those whom they are lending to. Here is a principle for the last days. This is where I want to get your mind to. We live in a debt society. We live in a borrowing community. You got to keep this in mind. That applies to individuals and that applies to nations. So the nations that borrow, I want you to have this concept so you understand what's happening in the world. You have the poor nations and they need money. And so they borrow, but it has to be paid back. What's going to happen to them? It's only getting them deeper into debt unless they turn their economies around, make more, earn more, raise more tax, or spend less. Or, for that matter, a fairer dispar uh, uh, sharing. And, of course, no corruption. It's the corruption. It's the corruption. This one, her name is Christine Lagarde. You might like to keep an eye on that lady. I will predict that by 2017, she will be the next French president. She has all the makings. She has a family. She takes care of the family. She's a very bright person. Very, seemed to be a very nice person. Very brainy. Of the International Monetary Fund called the IMF. It's also called, nicknamed, the Impossible Mission Fund. <laughs> and for good reasons. They collaborate with the World Bank, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Here we are, the World Bank. So the World Bank 
the critics say this. The World Bank and the IMF that work together, they're lending money to nations that need it, are concerned about the conditions imposed by the borrower on those countries. Let me explain something. When they lend money, they determine the interest rate. That's one. They also determine the length of the loan. That's two. They also determine where it should be spent. That is three. And they even determine the value of the currency of the nation that they are lending it to if it needs to be adjusted. Quite some liberties. Now you can imagine if you have a business and business is not good and you need money, you borrow. Unless you change something in your business system that causes you to need the money to be borrowed in the first place, unless you change the system, what's going to happen? You go down, 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 aren't you? Of course you are. Of course you are. It fails to resolve the economic problems within these countries. They are only actually making it worse. And that's a practical reality all over the globe to those countries. Their poverty relief programs create further dependency because they'll come back for more. Actually, funny enough, Greece is a wonderful example. They lend Greece, and this is mainly the euro, of course, the euro nations. So they lend to Greece, and Greece now has to raise more capital. How? Look at the unemployment. What on earth? Uh, you'll find again, there will be a default again. It has to happen. I like these images. Globalization is really aiming for profit. It's not charity. Globalization is not for charity. It is aiming for profit. People high up there that hold the reins of the cash flow decide where the money is going to go, who will get it and what it's spent on. Correct? They, they, they are planning. They are planning not for the benefit of the others. They are planning for the benefits of them, themselves. Nice to meet people and it's nice. I'm not against globalization. I think it's wonderful when nations interact, particularly on a commercial basis. I think that's all very good. But it's not about people. It is about money. Money comes first. Always. It does. The World Trade Organization, the countries in green are member states and the, the, the lighter green are associated with this practice. The World Trade Organization, I want you to see something. They aim to increase the number of bilateral free trade agreements uh, between governments. We just had a free trade agreement with China, for example. Because what normally happens is that the importing country puts tariffs on it. That is one thing that can be a serious break. And the other one is that if you as a government subsidize, let me give you an example. Suppose you're in the oranges, growing them here. I know somebody who does. The problem is there are cheaper oranges coming from overseas despite the freight. Why? It's subsidized. Did you know that? Of course he knows that. Do you understand? There are a whole range of particularly often agricultural products that are subject to that. So resolving conflicts between free trade on industrial goods and services is a tremendous task and challenge, but that is what the World Trade Organization does. But let me go back. Let me go back. There's something else I have to say about that. In the difficulties between the nations to have that free trade, Member states, and there's a whole list of members there that you saw all the green. You are not allowed as a member state to take in account how that product was made. And I'll come back to that in a minute. 
And I'm meaning child labor, underpaid labor. That cannot be taken in account. The ethics don't really come into it. And that is a serious problem for that organization. That is destroying the economic growth. That's from America there. If you look at the 1950s and 60s, for the money that was owing on their balance sheet, they would still get a GDP increase by $2.41. Then you go to the 1970s and 80s, it looks pretty sick compared to just 20 years before. Here, today, it is a disaster. Three cents on the current debt levels that they have. Does anybody know what the actual debt of America is? You're looking at about 17 trillion plus. That's a lot. That is an amazing amount. That is a horrible amount. See, the problem is, the problem is, when you look at that, the American banking system has over 60 trillion on that. That's a reasonable estimate. That's not the, the state, the government debt, that is the banking debt. And the problem is, they use, and I'm just getting a little bit technical here, leverage debt. Let me explain. Your bank, you go to your bank. And the bank lends you $10,000 because that's what you asked for, okay? Now, that money, is not owned by the bank. They deposit a certain portion of that with the reserve bank. But the bulk, up to 80 to 90% and more often, is really what's called leverage money. You might, you might ask, does that money actually exist? And the answer is, well, actually no. But until you get it in your account, it exists. But the money is only good if you pay back. Do you understand? If everybody collectively decided we're not paying back, how good is that money? That's no good. Here, here, the bank debts in America, this is all American stuff, 30%, 30 times faster, 30 times faster growth than the economy. They're having for real problems. In fact, they are having real problems. True? Does everybody follow this so far? I'm trying to explain where we're at, and then we look at some of the biblical statements. You're all with me still here? Okay, have a look at here. Will China help us? Will China help us? We have all our hopes invested on China. Don't do that. Don't do that. Before 2008, 4.3 years, you could buy a house in America. In China today, 18 years of income, don't spend a single yen and you can buy a house. Are you going to do that? It's impossible. In fact, if you look at the, 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 the structures that they have put up in China, it is marvelous. Not just empty buildings, we're talking about empty cities, isn't that correct? Absolutely true. Because people can't afford it. What's a good economy? Let's go for the bottom line. And you all understand this. A good economy is when people go to work, they earn and they spend. Yeah? They earn and they spend. I, I, I go to the parking place, I pay my parking fee, uh, they'll use it to pay staff, staff will use the money to pay the shopkeeper, etc., or electricity, or whatever. The money goes around. The money must go around. That's good. That's good. I'm earning the money, I'm working hard, and you can see that, and I... And I... What's a bad economy? A bad economy is when people borrow and spent. That's a bad economy. Do you understand? Because down the line, you will get a default. And that will affect the whole system. In a Christian perspective, an ethical Christian perspective, a bad economy is when you lay up for yourself treasures on earth, because where your treasure is, can you finish that for me? Okay, your heart will be also. That's bad economy for the Christian. And this is what this talk is about. A good economy for the Christian, good management, is when you lay up treasures, sorry, 
That's Solomon, we'll see him later. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, correct? Because they're enduring. It's the best investment you'll ever make. King Solomon in his wisdom, and he wasn't always overwhelmed with that, but here he wrote in Proverbs 22 verse 7. This is so true. The rich rule over the poor. Why? The borrower is the servant to the lender. The perils of borrowing. Uh, quite a number of you here, quite a number of you here, you know you're working for the bank? If you have a mortgage, you work for the bank. Right? Whatever finance company it is, you work for them. It's true. I know it's unavoidable. You never get your own possession of, of, of a property, but that is basically so true. Now, of course, if you are in a situation where you're totally reliant on organizations like the relief organizations like UNHCR, if you're in a country, in a situation where you have no hope of work, where you can't borrow because nobody's going to lend it to you because nobody, you, you, they know you'll never be in a position to pay it back. You are dependent on handouts because there's no social security. That in itself, as it's prevailing, creates an economic refugee. They have no options. It's very easy to say, oh, turn them back. No, 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 it's not that easy. When they come, whatever is amongst them, I, I know. The problem is, these people are escaping destitution. And if you would be in that same boat, you would do exactly the same thing. Yeah? You gotta have compassion. You don't have to be stupid, but you got to have compassion. That's important. And of course, slavery. This becomes, to me, I, I, I'm so repulsed when I see things like that. I, I, the image is good. It tells you. I, the, the, it tells you what's happening in the world. This is so repulsive, and yet... And yet it finds place. I cannot understand the lack of political will of the nations to put an end to that. It could be done. And it should be done. Did you know there are more slaves now than at any time in history? 30 million fueling that unwholesome occupation of human trafficking. That's a lot of people. Personally, I think it's more. And there are degrees. There are degrees of exploitation. But those are the people who don't own themselves anymore. And if the shoe fits, well, Nike, go for it. Slavery at the 21st century evil. You know, a lot of them are, are really uh, a lot closer than you think. Slave labor finds place. It does find place in agricultural, domestic work, Factories and sweatshops producing goods for global supply chains. We're actually part of the problem in a sense because we're buying the products. And we're not asking how it was achieved. And that's not good. That's not good. By understanding this, the Apostle Paul, he talks about the last days, the mindset that prevails, the mindset that is responsible for what I just put on the screen. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be what? Lovers of self? Have you ever, have you ever bumped into anybody that really loved themselves? Then was the last time you saw them. I hope it's a long time ago. Yeah? And so people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, would you say that people love money? Oh, yeah. Uh, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents. Any kids here that have defaulted? Uh, you're fulfilling a prophecy, I want you to know. Disobedient to parents 
Uh, he says, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, uh, unappeasable, slanderous, wow, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous. Blow me. He has a whole list of what's happening. And then he says, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather... And you know what? Our city is full of them. They rather love a good time than learn or worship about or worship God. It's a terrible, it's a terrible reality. It is a terrible reality. Having the appearance of godliness. Here is an interesting thing. Do you know the Apostle Paul is saying a lot of church people, you know, religious people, they have a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know, the gospel truth is not changing them. He said they are around. Avoid that people. Ooh. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't help them and teach them. But you don't assimilate. We are in a society that is consumed by consumption. It is thrown at you. Absolutely. Signs of the time of the end. Let's look at a few. Let's look at a few. Prophecies are being fulfilled. Perilous times. Are we living in perilous times? Oh, you better believe it. And I hate to say it. There is nothing on the horizon that says it's going to change for the better. Lovers of pleasure, more than God. Isn't that been the trend in our society? And it is just culminating in an unbelievable pace. People will be covetous. People will be boasters and proud. People will be unthankful. Now, now let's just stop at the last one. I meet so many people. They whinge. They complain. And anybody in this country that is complaining hasn't lived yet. If you compare what's going around, going on in the world around us. True? True. Rich oppressors will be judged. Now there's a prophecy that will be absolutely fulfilled. I want you to have a look at this. Come now you rich, weep and howl. And he says, he says, for your miseries that are coming upon you. So this is for everybody that has gotten wealthy. He said, your riches are corrupted. The way you've got that and accumulated that smells. He says, he says your garments are moth-eaten. I think of the high fashion and what people spend on high fashion. In the world with these tremendous needs... Tremendous needs. He said, your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold, your silver are corroded. They never corrode, but their corrosion will be a witness against you. You have hoarded it. You haven't used it. Now it becomes an indictment. Now it becomes an indictment. And you, it, it will eat your flesh like fire. This has to do with a judgment. You know, you can't just, you can't just accumulate wealth. And keep it to yourself. Or for your own purposes. God will require an answer to the question. What did you do? What did you do? I like this statement. All means entrusted to man are entrusted, let me see how the saying goes, for the basic necessities of life. But anything beyond the basic necessities of life, it is entrusted to men to do good and to bless humanity. Get it? And whether you do, that's another thing. Uh, you have heaped a treasure in the last days and you are in trouble. There is a destroying fire on the way, which means you're not saved. 
Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your field. You say, well, I haven't got a field and I haven't got laborers in the field. But you know, this is an agricultural society. The people that have worked for you. He says, he says, you have kept by fraud. You have underpaid or not paid them. It happens. He said, it cries out. That is crying out. That is your indictment. Like the blood of Abel, innocent Abel, cried out from the ground. It didn't cry out. The evidence cries out. That is evidence. God, God has a note on everything. And then the cries of the reapers who have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts when people complain. They may not complain to you, but God hears that hardship. He sees that. And so this is important. You have lived in pleasure and luxury. You have murdered the just. For he does not resist you. They can't resist you. You're in power. And no, you haven't murdered them. You just got them to work. But what have you done? What is murder? Murder is taking someone's life. Yeah, Around the globe. There are murders committed at such an alarming volume and nobody's getting killed. But they robbed of their life anyway. That's equal to murder. Do you understand? And that's the terrible world that we live in. It's true. And it's gotten worse. So on the island of Patmos, 96 AD, he sees in vision, he sees a, what shall we say, an unholy alliance between state and church. This is interesting, and you should take really notice of it. You may not fully understand, that's okay, but you'll get the picture. Have a look at this. That no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, the name of the beast, and the number of his name. In other words, this is relating to God's people. There's going to be a time, there's going to be a time that you can't buy or sell. It's like living next to the airport, isn't it? The reason is, there's a collaboration between state and church. And just before Jesus returns, you can't buy or sell. But you will be cared for by God. You have nothing to fear. But that's what will happen. That's how the capacity to implement it. Written in 96 AD. If you said all over the world, in the global sense, certain people, I'm going to prevent them from buying and selling, everybody would have laughed at you. You couldn't do that globally. What do you need is fantastic. You need a globalization of politics. You need a globalization economically. And in this case, you would need a globalization religiously. Isn't that interesting? We certainly have the capacity politically. Because due to the terror and terror threats, governments are working together on a level of such intensity if anything could be brought about in one day and implemented it is today globalization economically well economic globalization ceased to that it wouldn't matter where you were we're living in interesting times We're living in times when a statement like that made in 96 AD doesn't look so fantastic out of the order and impossible at all. It could be done. And that is certainly a fulfillment in its own way of prophecy. The capacity to implement is incredible. And so, that unholy alliance will fall apart Here's another prediction. Just before Jesus comes, when it becomes clear that the end of the world is near, the kings of the earth who committed fornication, and li- that means an illicit relationship between state and church, will, and lived luxury with her, that is the overriding political system, will weep, lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Look at the rest. And the merchant of the earth will weep and mourn over her 
No one buys their merchandise anymore. What the Bible is saying that ultimately, ultimately, good day, Fred, ultimately you will have a position where all your money is useless. In fact, if you listen to James, if you have too much of it, it's an indictment. Did you understand that? Now, did you, did, you, did you understand it? If you have too much, selfishly hoarded it, kept it for yourself, it's an accusation against you. So if you have too much, let's have another collection. <laughs> no, no, I'm only kidding. But you get, you get the principle here, yeah? You get the principle here. Okay, this is what's coming. You see, you see, so you can have a glitch. And if the glitch stays, you have a problem. And if the problem stays, you have a disaster. Do you understand? That's where it's going to end up. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. The Bible has so much to say on the topic. Have a look at this statement. The parable of the sower. Some of the seed, uh, others, uh, sown amongst the thorns. These are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world. Have a look at this. The deceitfulness of riches and the desire for things enter in, choke the word, and it proves to be unfruitful. How often that doesn't happen amongst church attending people just the same. It does. It does. Um, have a look at this one. Just, just a few. Uh, God and riches. You, no one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other. You say, no, no, I love my possessions, but I love God too. But you will love one more than the other. And in the Hebrew, they use a hyperbole to indicate the difference between who you love in the first place and who you love in the second place. And the love in the first place is love, the second place must be hate. It's what's called a hyperbole, grammatically. And so, and so, I will hate the one, love the other, or will be devoted to the one, despise the other. L l l you cannot serve God and mammon. L let, me, let me ask you something. What has occupied your time the most this week? Don't answer that. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I know we got to make a living, so do I. Do not labor for the food that perishes, for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father sets his seal. You are his property. And that's a marvelous assurance. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you didn't do to any of the least of these, my brethren, you, or you did do, you did it, to me. Very important. So God takes it personal if you neglect your fellow man because of your own personal ambitions or gratification. Whatever, whatever. We're almost there. You know him, Bernard Madoff? He's 77 years old. Not so long ago, he was one of the richest men in the world. He was, wasn't he, Fred? He was, yes. Oh, he was. He was doing so well. The best of living styles, billions of dollars. He was doing so well. In March 2009, Bernie Madoff pleaded guilty to 11 federal offenses and admitted to turning his wealth management business into a massive Ponzi scheme. It was massive. They defrauded, he defrauded thousands of people of billions of dollars. How did he do it? That was clever in itself. But not all that clever. He admitted that's what he did. He's oh, he's in jail for the next 150 years. Now, let me say that uh, minus 209, that is six years. He still has got 144 years to go. And then he can come out. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? That's the maximum allowed. I don't know why they allow it. It's useless, isn't it? I tell you what, he'll beat it. I'm telling you, he's going to beat 150 years. But here is it, the last slide. Luxury life. 
I, I know we all like our comforts. I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure. But I hope, I pray that somehow you got to jest. If you pursue in life, and it doesn't have to be material wealth. It can be, it can be more than that. It could be different possessions. It could be, it could be an achievement academically that you really, really, really desire more than a relationship with your God. It can be, it can be your affections, your affinity to another person. You really like that person. You really love that person. And probably that person is a very good person, and so are you but you still got to put Jesus first. You have to. It can't be blessed if you didn't. And so, and so a luxury life. What will it profit a man, Jesus' words, if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Here is a reality. You've been to funerals? He who dies with the most toys is just as dead. Millionaires don't die. They stop being millionaires. Billionaires don't just die. They just stop being billionaires. Because all the money goes to whoever. The reality is this. Life is so short, true? True. I mean, when you're young, you think, oh, no, no, I'm going to be, you know, this is. And then one day you look in the mirror. And you know it's you. Or somebody sings happy birthday for you. Again. You've heard it 70 times before. You don't want to hear it again. Here's a message for you. The interesting thing is, our life is so short. Why would you not follow the divine counsel in the last days? Why won't you find? Because you don't want to receive an eternal life sentence, do you? Because that, I mean, man of comes, comes of light with 150 years. Suppose your sentence was that you miss out on eternal life. That's an eternal sentence, folks. That's an eternal sentence. We look at the globe. We look at what's happening around the world. Everything has been predicted. It is all moving in that direction. We have no excuse. We must live according to the counsel that Jesus gave us. And you know what? <laughs> Gold? How about walking on it? Yeah. Walking on streets of gold. And we're not talking about the buildings yet. I hope you're all there. My heart and prayer says this. I wish and I hope and I plead that you take heed and that we will be there. May God bless you. Do we have a special item? Yes, we do. And uh, this is a song that I wrote a few Sabbaths back, and um, it's just giving glory to our wonderful God that um, is here in the midst with us, if we care to seek. And uh, the big question is how, in, how it is in the world that's around us, with what's going on, can we see that God is still alive? And... Um, and we can look into that if we're willing to look uh, into the Word and, and know that there is God, a loving God that pursues us. So um, thanks for Baron's message today. This one's called God of Wonder.
knew it was sound. You breathed life into me, and everyone else saw around. You're a god of wonder, I'm glad I can see. God of wonder, true mystery. You're a God of wonder, story of love between you and me. When it was stolen away through our misty. You've been promised a way for us to return. You gave your only son to be a ransom. For you so loved the world. Yeah, you so loved the world. You're a God of wonder, I'm glad I can see. God of wonder, true mystery. You're a God of wonder, a story of love between you and me. It's just the storm in the teacup. When we see what say around When an earthquake hits Buildings fall to the ground When we see the destruction From the pestilence How can we say
Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful item. I've never heard it before. I've never heard it before, but I, I loved it. Thank you so much for that message and that ministry. Shall we uh, bow our heads? Heavenly Father, as we have been here together this afternoon, we have tried to understand the world around us as it has developed. And yes, we have questions, and maybe not all the answers are there, but we know one thing. That no matter what success might come our way, it'll be nothing if you are not in the first place. You are our God. And we have to put you first. Because you are worthy. And unless we can do this in a love response of the love that you have shown, what good would it be? to achieve all of our ambitions and not be with you in the end. And so, Lord, we pray for that understanding, for that determination that we will put Jesus first. He is the most important one in our life. And, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. And Lord, as we go outside and we partake of the food, we ask for the blessing on the food, but particularly the fellowship, as we mingle, as we talk to one another, uplifting one and another to that same common goal, to make sure that one day soon, when Jesus returns, we shall walk the streets of gold of the new Jerusalem. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you.